I want to play something here that literally made tears come to my eyes. Please listen. The Canadian Parliament, uh, he is going to be addressing um, Congress virtually tomorrow. This is a live picture, by the way, of the uh, Canadian Parliament. Uh, they appear to be uh, getting ready to hear from President Zelensky. There, of course, is uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Um, well, we're not going to listen in just yet, but we'll go back when President Zelensky starts. When he addresses Congress tomorrow, Peter Baker, uh, what do we expect to hear from, from President Zelensky? Well, I think you're going to hear him, first of all, of course, thank the West for, for, for what they've done. But he's going to push hey, them. Peter, Peter I, gonna... hate to, mm -hmm. I hate to interrupt you. Um, I think we just saw him pop up, President Zelensky. Peter, if you can, stick around. Um, let's, um, let's listen in for just a moment. Peter will talk about it on the other side. Ukrainian immigrants came to Canada. Many of them settled in the Canadian prairies. They worked the land. They built churches distinguished by their beautiful spires, and they helped shape Canada in significant ways. Notre pays compte aujourd'hui 1.4 million de Canadiens d'origine ukrainienne, ce qui constitue la deuxième plus grande diaspora ukrainienne au monde. Que ce soit en tant qu'agriculteur, scientifique, leader communautaire, athlète ou travailleur de première ligne, les Canadiens d'origine ukrainienne continue d'apporter une immense contribution à notre pays. Mais l'amitié entre le Canada et l'Ukraine ne repose pas seulement sur cette histoire commune, elle repose aussi sur nos valeurs communes. Volodymyr, in the years I've known you, I've always thought of you as a champion for democracy. And now, democracies around the world are lucky to have you as our champion. Your courage and the courage of your people inspires us all. You're defending the right of Ukrainians to choose their own future. And in doing so, you're defending the values that form the pillars of all free democratic countries. Freedom, human rights, justice, truth, international order. These are the values you're risking your life for as you fight for Ukraine and Ukrainians. Beyond that, you're inspiring democracies and democratic leaders around the world to be more courageous, more united, and to fight harder for what we believe in. You remind us that friends are always stronger together. With allies and partners, we're imposing crippling sanctions to make sure Putin and his enablers in Russia and Belarus are held accountable. Today, in line with our European Union partners, I can announce that we have imposed severe sanctions on 15 new Russian officials, including government and military elites who are complicit in this illegal war. Le Canada va continuer de soutenir l'Ukraine en lui fournissant de l'équipement militaire ainsi que de l'aide financière et humanitaire. Et on va être là pour aider à rebâtir une fois que l'agresseur sera repoussé. In Canada, we like to root for the underdog. We believe that when a cause is just and right, it will always prevail, no matter the size of the opponent. This doesn't mean it'll be easy. Ukrainians are already paying incalculable human costs. This 
illegal and unnecessary war is a grave mistake, and Putin must stop it now. Le mépris flagrant de Vladimir Poutine pour la vie humaine est absolument inacceptable. Le Canada continue d'exiger que la Russie cesse de cibler les civils et mette fin à cette guerre injustifiable. Les Ukrainiens sont en train de se l'autoritarianisme. Et comme parlementaires, unis dans cette house aujourd'hui, et tous les Canadiens, nous sommes avec vous. As friends, you can count on our unwavering and steadfast support. And now, it is my great privilege to introduce to you all the President of Ukraine, our friend, Volodymyr Zelensky. region. Can you only imagine? Imagine that on the on 4 a.m. each of you you start hearing bomb explosions, severe explosion. Justin, can you imagine hearing you, your children, hear all these severe explosions, bombing of airport, bombing of Ottawa airport, tens of other cities of your wonderful country. Can you imagine that? Cruise, cruise missiles are being falling down on your terrain and your children are asking you what happened and you are receiving the first news which infrastructure objects have been bombed and destroyed by Russian Federation and you know how many people already died can you only imagine what words how can you explain to your children that you just, uh, full-scale aggression just happened in your country. You know that this is war to annihilate your state, your country. You know that this is the war to subjugate your people. And on second day, you receive uh, notifications that huge cones of military equipment are entering your country crossing the border, they're entering small cities, they are giving siege, they're encircling cities, and, and they start to shell civil neighborhoods. They bomb school buildings, they destroyed kindergarten facilities, like in our city, city of Sumy, like in city of Ohtyrka. Imagine that someone is taking siege, laying siege to Vancouver. Can you just imagine them for a second? And all these people who are left in such city. And this is exactly the situation that our city of Mariupol is suffering right now. And they are left without heat or hydro, or without means of communicating, almost without food, without water, seeking shelter in bomb shelters. Dear Justin, Dear guests, can you imagine that every day you receive 
memorandums about the number of casualties, including among women and children. You've heard about the bombings. Currently we have 97 children that died during this war. Can you imagine famous CN Tower in Toronto? If, they, if it was hit by Russian bombs. Of course, I don't wish this on anyone, but this is our reality in which we live. We have to contemplate and we have to see where the next bombing will take place. Your church is square. We have a freedom square in the city of, of in the city of Harden. Our Babin Yard, the place where uh, uh, victims of Holocaust were buried, and they, they, it has been bombed by the Russians. Imagine that Canadian facilities have been bombed similarly as our buildings and memorial places are being bombed. A number of families have died. Every night is a horrible night. The Russians are shelling from all kinds of artillery, from tanks. They are hitting civilian infrastructure. They are hitting big buildings. Uh, can you imagine that there is a uh, fire starting at a nuclear power plant and that's exactly what happened in our country. Each city that they are marching through, they are taking down the Ukrainian flags. Can you imagine someone taking down your Canadian flags in Montreal and other Canadian cities? I know that you all support Ukraine. Uh, we've been friends with you, Justin, but also I would like you to understand and I would like you to feel this, what we feel every day. We want to live and we want to be victorious. We want to prevail for the sake of life. Can you imagine when you, when you call your friends, your friendly nation, and you ask, please close the sky, Close the airspace. Please stop the bombing. How many more cruise missiles have to fall on our cities until you make this happen? And they, in return, they express their deep concerns about the situation. When we talk to with our partners and they say, please hold on, hold on a little longer. Some, some people are talking about es trying to avoid the escalation and at the same time in response to our aspiration to become members of NATO we also do not hear a clear answer. Sometimes we don't see obvious things. It's a, it's a dire straits, but it also allowed us to see who our real friends are over the last 20 days, and as well, eight previous years. I'm sure that you've been able to see clearly what's going on, and I'm addressing all of you. Canada has always been steadfast in their support. It's, you've been a reliable partner to Ukraine and Ukrainians, and I'm sure this will continue. You've offered your help, your assistance at the, our earliest request. You supply us with the military assistance, with humanitarian assistance. You've imposed severe sanctions, serious sanctions. At the same time, we see that, unfortunately, this does, they did not bring the end to the war. You, see, you can see that our cities like Kharkiv, Mariupol, and many other cities are not protected just like your cities are protected, Edmonton, Vancouver. You can see that Kyiv is being shelled and bombed, Ivano-Frankivsk city, Ivano-Frankivsk. 
it used to be we were a very peaceful country, peaceful cities, but now they're being constantly bombarded. Bombarded. Basically, what I'm trying to say that we all need to do, you all need to do more to stop Russia, to protect Ukraine, and by doing that, to protect Europe from Russian threat. They're destroying everything: memorial complexes, schools, uh, hospitals. Uh, uh, housing complex. They already killed 97 Ukrainian children. We are not asking for much. We are asking for justice, for real support, which will help us to prevail, to defend, to save life, to save life all of the world. Canada is leading in these efforts. And I'm hoping that other countries will follow the same suit. We are asking for more of your leadership. And please take more, uh, greater part in these efforts, Justin and all of our friends of our of Ukraine, all friends of the truth. Uh, please understand how important it is for us to close our airspace from Russian missiles and Russian aircrafts. I hope you can understand. I hope you can increase your efforts, you can increase sanctions so they, don't, so they will not have a single dollar to fund their war effort. Uh, commercial entities should not be working in Russia. Probably you know better than many in any other countries that this attack on Ukraine it's an, their attempt to annihilate Ukrainian people and there is nothing else to it. This is their main objective. It's actually the war against Ukrainian people. And it's an attempt to destroy everything that we as Ukrainians do. It's an attempt to destroy our future, to destroy our nation, our character. You Canadians, you know very well all this. That's why I'm asking you, please do not stop in your efforts. Please expand your efforts to bring back peace in our peaceful country. I believe and I know that you can do it. And we are building, we are part of the anti-war coalition and jointly I'm sure that we'll achieve results. I would like to also ask our Ukrainian diaspora in Canada. This is a historical moment and we need your support, your practical support. And we hope that with your practical steps you will show that you are part of the more than Ukrainian history. Please remember, this is a, a practical modern day history of Ukraine. We want to live, we want to have peace. I am grateful to everyone of you in the Parliament of Canada who is present there, to every Canadian citizen. I am very grateful to you, Justin. I am grateful to Canadian people and I am confident that together we will overcome and will be victorious. Glory to Ukraine. Thank you to Canada. Wow. Let freedom ring. <clears throat> Let freedom ring. What a historical moment. What a historical, unprecedented moment. If that won't make the free world tear up, won't nothing. Won't nothing make you tear up. If that won't make you tear up towards what's happening right now.
What an applause. Showing their emotions, showing their support, showing their sympathy in what has happened to the Ukrainians. Sustained standing thunderous applause from members of Canada's parliament for Ukraine's President Zelensky there after those comments. Uh, President Zelensky saying at one point, quote, we want to live, we want to be victorious. He once again renewed uh, those calls for a no-fly zone over his country. Uh, back with me, Peter Baker, Chief White House Correspondent for the New York Times, an MSNBC political analyst, uh, has covered Russia for years. At one point, he was the bureau chief there. Uh, Peter, we just heard him there speak through a translator, but speak directly to Canada's Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, called him by his first name a number of times, uh, trying to make his old friend understand the sheer hell that Ukrainians are living through. Uh, President Zelensky going to be addressing our lawmakers tomorrow. What what kind of response from the West will you be watching for after his remarks to members of Congress here, Peter? Yeah, th this is a powerful moment. And one of the reasons it's powerful, Craig, is because Ukraine has a particularly resonant uh, feeling toward Ukraine. Uh, Canada, sorry, Canada has a very resonant uh, feeling toward Ukraine. More people of Ukrainian extraction live in Canada than anywhere in the world outside of Ukraine and Russia, about 1.4 million people. The, the woman who is sitting two to the left of Prime Minister Trudeau, as you saw her on the screen, that's Christian Freeland. She's the finance minister in Canada, former foreign minister in Canada. Uh, she's Ukrainian, of a training, I've been to her home. She speaks Ukrainian with her children around the table. This is a big deal in Canada. That's why you saw the passion and the emotion in their response to what they heard there. But it's a tough message from President Zelensky because what he's telling them is, yeah, I appreciate what you've done. We're in this together. Thank you very much, but you haven't done enough. And that's the message he'll no doubt deliver tomorrow to the U.S. Congress as well. And it's one thing to say sanctions, that's great, he's saying, but we need you to do more. And what he's asking for, though, is something that's very complicated. The notion of a no-fly zone sounds simple enough, but it's really not. And both Democrats and Republicans here in Washington would tell you that that is basically paramount to, uh, you know, getting into this war in a real way. If you're going to have a no-fly zone enforced by NATO or the United States, that means you're committing to shooting down Russian planes over Ukrainian airspace, which is only a couple steps away from a full-scale war. That's something that President Biden and many members of Congress in both parties want to avoid. But there is a passion for finding a way to help Ukraine, and the no-fly zone is being discussed uh, increasingly here in Washington as well as elsewhere in the West. Peter, can, can the Ukrainians win this war uh, or keep Russia uh, from taking it over, not to oversimplify it, but can, can they do that without the existence of a no-fly zone? Well, I mean, you know, what a lot of people would tell you, military experts would tell you, and I'm not a military expert, sure. is that the no-fly zone isn't necessarily the biggest thing that they need right now, because a lot of the damage that you're showing on the screen right now, a lot of the uh, devastation that the Russians are causing is through through artillery and, and, and land-based uh, weaponry missiles and things that a no-fly zone wouldn't do anything to stop. So it, it, as a military matter, uh, Ukraine needs a whole lot more than, than a, a no-fly zone, but obviously that would be a big deal if it were to happen. You know, can Ukraine win? 
again, I'm again not a military expert, but they have shown in the last few weeks that they're not going to go down softly. They're not going to go down easily. And Russia, if they want to overpower Ukraine, they have the firepower, presumably, to do that over the long term. But what they're being told is it will not be easy and they will continue to fight even if they lose their cities and their military. One of the things that really does continue to, to amaze me, uh, Peter Baker, and you just saw it there and, uh, and at, at Parliament there in Canada, likely we'll see the same thing tomorrow, uh, the way that President Zelensky has managed to unite uh, lawmakers from, from different parties, not just here, not just in Canada, but around the world, it would seem. Uh, Mr. Baker, thank you for your time. Thank you for your insight and your perspective, as always, sir. Almost every second since the war in Ukraine started 20 days ago, every second there's been a new child refugee from that country. That's according to some brand new data from UNICEF. Up next, I'll talk to a UNICEF official about how they are trying to help those kids. But first, here's what one volunteer told our own Gabe Gutierrez in Hungary. Alex Vaga is a Hungarian volunteer handing out supplies. He's just 15 years old. And I have a friend whose whole family is dead. No one deserves this. I really don't like it. I'm trying my best to help, but I'm just a 15-year-old kid. I can't read really much. Wait. That was a very, very emotional moment and time. <laughs> towards hearing that speech and listening to the Prime Minister of Canada in a very, very voiceless movement of support. And as I have said before, this is not just about a certain group of people. This goes beyond that. This is not just about the lives of the Ukrainians or the future of the Ukrainians. This is basically about the future of all democracies throughout the whole global universe. That we as a free, fair, open society, not just here in America, but throughout the planet, will not put up with this type of aggression with this type of, of violence and hostility simply because of a group of people that has chosen to want to live free and not be ruled by, by a tyrant, uh, by an aggressor, which is basically the same thing as a slave owner. We have learned our lessons here in America and as well as other countries throughout the planet that slavery needs to be abolished from the global society in a civilized society in the 21st century. If our children and our children's children is going to have any type of future, the tyrants that rule over various people, regardless whether it be in Russia or China or any other part of the world, is only doing what they're doing for their own self-pleasure and benefit. That is exactly what a republic, free, fair democracy is the opposite of. We do not choose to want to be ruled by a slave owner. We do not wish to be ruled necessarily by a tyrant king or a oligarch. It's up to our doings. It's our choosings. At this particular moment in history, towards whether or not we are true at heart, towards standing up for the things that those before us have stood up before, <clears throat> pertaining to freedom. And a republic democracy. And if we're not willing to do that today, then we are not deserving of the freedoms that we have today, similar towards 
what we have just witnessed on a global scale pertaining to the Afghanistan, <clears throat> the Afghanistan natives, that America sacrificed 20 plus years in going over there and teaching them how to fight for their own freedom, how we went over there to reform a group of people and letting them know that these things was incorrect and wrong towards being enslaved by a society of tyrants such as the Taliban or the Jihad or any other any other cruel and different body of people or person. And then when we left after handing the Afghanistan people the golden goose, within 11 days they laid down and didn't put up a, even a, so much as a fight towards allowing for the Taliban to take back over their country. The women and the children over in the Afghanistan area, we pray for every day because we know the atrocities that are happening to them right now, even as we speak. We pray for the innocent and the elderly, the sick and the weak, because it was because of their grown men that wouldn't stand, that wouldn't be the watchman on the wall towards preventing from this occurring. The Afghanistan people in Afghanistan has no one to blame but their own party, their own men that obviously let their own people down. It is so, so sad when you see the goodwill of the Americans that went into a impoverished area that was being being dis, disfigured and disformed, perverted. And to go and spend 20 plus years <clears throat> and hand them all that artillery and all that machinery and to think that they didn't even give up a, even so much as a fight, basically laid down, was a disgrace to the free world. It was a disgrace towards the deeds and the works that the American people subjected themselves into towards all the sacrifices that was made for the Afghanistan people. We pray that there will be a new beginning with the Afghanistan people and that eventually they will understand that the things that they have given up are things that you cannot buy. These are things that you cannot, you cannot get in the bottom of a Cracker Jack box. You can't walk up to freedom and say, I deserve it. Please let me rule my own life. You have to earn these things. That's the reason why the Americans say again and again, that freedom is never free. You have to be willing to stand up, even at the very sacrifice of your own blood. For the Bible says, what greater love have there than a brother that's willing to lay down his or her life for another brother or sister? Until you can prove yourself to these oligarchs, to these tyrants, to these pharaohs, to these rootless dictators such as Putin and, and dictators over in China and dictators all over the world until you can prove to them that we're not going or that you're not going to put up with any type of such slavery as that. They're going to continue to rule your lives, damage your lives, and eventually destroy your lives. That was the whole primary concept in God speaking to Moses and Moses going to the Pharaohs, to the Egyptians on 10 different occasions to let my people go. 
let my people go. And the heart of Pharaoh had been hardened until there towards the last, once he realized that the God of Moses was greater than any kind of God that he ever began to imagine, that basically brought humiliation and victory for the children of Israel. We want of this day to be remembered of the sacrifices that has been made in the past, not just by the Americans, but throughout the world of other cultures of other generations that was willing to stand up against this type of aggression so that we pray and hope for a better tomorrow for our children and our children's children, just as you see in this picture right now. May God have mercy upon America. May God have mercy upon our military, and may God have mercy on all the, all the nations for a healing, for them standing up for a free, fair world that the seed has been planted for thousands of years, proven to the demonic kingdom that the meek will be the ones that will inherit the earth. It will not be the demonic. It will not be the cruel. It will not be the tyrannies. It will not be the oligarchs. It will not be evil demonic kings or the pharaohs. But it will be the meek. It will be those who have a sense of duty in understanding that all lives matter. No matter what side of the continent that you may be on, that all lives matter. Black, white, red, yellow. All lives matter. And if the leaders of today's society can't understand that, then obviously they are under some sort of hypnotic spell that the only way to defeat a bad person with these types of resistance movements is with a good person with the same type of resistance movements, even, even if it means sacrificing your own life for. Thank you for listening. Shalom and good luck to each and every man, woman, and child upon the planet. And may God have mercy on us all. Shalom. Thank you for listening.